Hello everybody, today on the channel, the Toyota GR86, the successor to the GT86, a car which was hotly anticipated by driving enthusiasts around the world, yet when it arrived was met with somewhat subdued fanfare as it failed to find an audience, particularly in markets like the UK. However, this sold out in just 90 minutes, long before anybody had got the chance to get behind the wheel. With deliveries now happening across the globe, I'm going to be telling you whether those people lucky enough to place an order were right or wrong. I feel sorry for Toyota because for years many driving enthusiasts and journalists around the world were begging them to make something just like the GT86. We were all getting misty eyed about the days when you could buy at an affordable price a small lightweight sports coupe with the engine up the front, drive to the rear, a manual gearbox in the middle and smiles achieved not through outright pace but instead sheer driving pleasure. An antidote to the modern ultra capable hot hatch. So Toyota actually went and gave us exactly what we were asking for. Naturally, they expected us all to lap it up, but instead they were met with cries of, no, no, not like that. And I'll confess, I was one of those people. I loved the GT86 in concept, but the reality far less so. It was priced keenly sure and not a bad looker, but the engine was entirely gutless low down. People would say, well, the idea is you need to rev it out. It's a naturally aspirated two litre four cylinder. That's the point of it, sure but it wasn't an enjoyable engine to rev out and it had an almost inexplicable torque dip right in the centre of the rev range where you spend a lot of your time. This was such an issue that even Toyota themselves referenced it in the press release for this. It was a far cry from the old screaming 16 valve twin cams of old that all of us hoped Toyota were building. It was a very similar story with the chassis. You see, in their quest to try and make the car playful, I think Toyota made a fundamental mistake. The fact is, chassis engineers will not deliberately design a bad car, and those from yesteryear that we remember so fondly for their tail-out antics only had that because the chassis itself wasn't particularly grippy, and nor were the tyres. But a modern chassis, even one not designed for lap times, is still going to be much better than one from the 1980s. So taking on board the 86's relatively low power and torque figures, in order to get a car which was a little bit tail happy, Toyota gave it some unusual suspension settings and Michelin primacy tyres, economy tyres, the same ones you'd find on something like a Prius. In fact, you could even have your 86 with the same wheels as a Prius. They're quite nice actually, magnesium too, very cool. But the net result of all of this was that instead of a car that was simply a bit of fun, what you had was one you couldn't trust because it would grip, grip and then go without any warning. And that's just not enjoyable. And I don't think it helped that around the world there were no fewer than three different versions of effectively the same car. The Toyota 86 or GT86, depending on where you were. The Subaru BRZ, which was somewhat understandable on account of the fact the car was actually engineered and built by Subaru. And the somewhat less understandable and oft forgotten Scion FRS. I believe unique to the American market. I cannot speak for the global market, but here in the UK I think the GT86 was a sales disaster. Over a decade they shifted just seven and a half thousand of them. To give you some context, VW would sell nearly that many Golf R's in a year. When you consider that and the even bigger disaster that was the fifth generation Supra, you'd imagine it to be very reasonable for just about any manufacturer to say, fine, we gave you what you wanted, you didn't buy it, we're off to go and keep making all the cars you complain about, yet sell really, really well. But not Toyota. Because they're back, this is the GR, the 86's difficult second album. And do not mistake it for last year's reheated leftovers, though in concept it may be the same. 2 plus 2, sporty looking coupe, front engine, rear wheel drive, they have made a lot of changes. And spoiler alert, it's rather good. Let's start at the pointy end, shall we? As before, this car is powered by a naturally aspirated four-cylinder Subaru-built boxer engine. However, capacity here is now up 20% over the old car, 2.4 litres versus two. And this increase in displacement has been achieved through the use of a larger bore, helping the engine maintain its 7,500 RPM redline. Naturally, power is up, this engine producing around 230 horses versus the old car's plain 200. But it's the torque figure which is the most startling. The old car made 205 Nm at a heady 6,600 RPM. This 250 Nm 
at 3,700. That's incredible. And in case you were wondering, in old money, that's a 184 pound foot. So in isolation, not impressive, but as you'll see, it's more than enough. Toyota are keen to point out the car's performance has been achieved not just by the increase in displacement, but also a revised intake and exhaust system, as well as a new fuel delivery setup. This car combines both port and direct injection. And perhaps most interesting of all, Toyota's press release even mentions the fact they've strengthened the con rods too. And no doubt, somewhere around the world, a modder's ears have just pricked up in excitement. As before, this car is a collaboration between Toyota and Subaru. That is the reason it has a flat four boxer engine. However, Toyota were always keen to point out the only reason it has direct injection is because of Toyota's input. They demanded it and Subaru said it could not be done until Toyota showed them that it could. As before, the default and I'm sure most popular transmission is a six speed manual, which sends power to the rear wheels via a Torsen limited slip differential. A six speed torque converter automatic is also available. It's one of the very few options you can specify on the car and weirdly also comes with pre-collision alert, lane departure warning and adaptive cruise control, things you cannot have on a manual even if you want them. In fact, the only other options you can specify on the car are metallic or pearlescent paint. I like that. And I love the price. A manual GR86 could have been yours for 29995 on the road, the automatic being about £2,000 more. That is sensational value for money, and I've no doubt Toyota could have sold a heck of a lot more of these than they have. Rumour has it that just 400 are coming to the UK. Why so few? Well, the answer is simple crash regulations. In two years, this will not meet them. And there is only a certain number of cars that Toyota will be able to make in that time. That's why it's sad. I don't like it. But rather than lament the fact that we're not going to get many of these, I'm instead going to try and be thankful for the fact we got it at all. In case you were thinking that's because this is just a GT86 with new bumpers and a bigger engine, you'd be wrong. The chassis has also seen significant work. It is an evolution of the original, but thanks to extra strengthening, it's now 60% stiffer at the front and 50% stiffer overall. But thanks to the use of clever, lightweight materials, it's also no heavier than it ever was. This car is just under 1300 kilos as a manual and just over as an automatic. They've even managed to lower the center of gravity by 1.6 millimeters, and I'm sure no one will fail to notice that. The center of gravity has also been moved rearward by 0.05%, yet the car remains slightly front biased. 53% plays 47 at the back. And one of the few spec disappointments for me is the suspension. At the rear, you have double wishbones, which is great, but up the front, a far more simple McPherson strut setup. And even the MX-5 can do better than that. And I have always wondered whether it's because of that slightly wider boxer engine up the front that Toyota didn't use a more sophisticated suspension setup. They're no strangers to double wishbone or multi-link, and they certainly know the benefits. So why they chose to omit it here, I do not know. In terms of design, I wouldn't say it's a great looking car. It's a little fussy in places with an air of aftermarket about some of it, but it's far from ugly and I think will sit very well with its intended audience. The interior is similarly functional. To Toyota's credit, some real effort appears to have gone into making this a nice space, and largely I would say it has been successful. Just as well, because if you do buy a GR86, this is how it's going to be. If I were to criticise Toyota for anything, I would say they missed an opportunity for a little bit extra cash by not offering a premium upgrade. At 29995 this car is ludicrously good value, but I think there's plenty of people out there with slightly deeper pockets who would have happily spent another three, four, five thousand pounds on an option that gives you just a little bit more of everything. More tech, more features, more leather, more luxury, all that sort of stuff. But regardless, the fundamentals here are right. There's enough of both leather and ultra suede in here, it's not Alcantara, to make it feel like a slightly nicer place than many a Japanese cabin. I love these seats. They're a touch narrow in the base for me, but not enough to be an issue. They are, of course, manual, but they've also got enough sculpting to them that they're both supportive and also enough padding that they're quite comfortable over longer journeys. In fact, if you drop the headrest down, they actually look really quite sporty too. Unfortunately, the chairs in the rear are somewhat less accommodating, and I would call those child seats at best. You can though fold them down, giving you even more space in the back, and that I think is how the vast majority of people are going to drive this, as a 2 plus naught with very, very occasional rear seating for, um, well, very, very understanding passengers. 
The steering wheel is another highlight, small, beautiful in the hand and very simple. Toyota have also resisted the urge to add too much padding to it which could rob you of vital feel. You've got all the controls you need and behind it you also have a very simple but elegant display that shows you everything you need and not a bit more. It has a second racier mode which can be activated by pressing one of the traction control buttons down here. One thing to point out, if you're wondering what that blank button is, in an automatic that would be the sport mode, but here you simply don't need it. The pedal box is also more generous than I expected. You can easily drive this car even in fairly large footwear, and that I do appreciate. Same goes for the heated seats, another concession to making this car very usable if you want to drive it every single day. I will however be deducting points for the infotainment. It has all the functionality you would need, including Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but it somehow feels like a system that's already 10 years old. The display isn't very high resolution and the graphics look, well, laughable to be honest. But worst of all, not only is the stereo fairly poor, but play music at even a modest volume and this door rattles quite badly, including on many a track where I've never had any car rattle. I would go so far as to say I think that's a fault with this particular car. I hope it's a fault with this particular car because I promise you there was nowhere near enough bass coming out of these speakers to rattle anything. That's odd. The switch gear in said door is nice enough. In Japanese tradition, it's not very pretty, but it works well and feels solid in the hand. I also appreciate the fact that they've made the door pockets a little bit larger so they'll accommodate a bottle. You have two more cup holders in here below what I suppose I could call the armrest, but frankly isn't because it's just a bit too low. That's another small gripe that I have. In other good news, the HVAC system is brilliant and proves that touchscreens are simply unnecessary for that kind of thing. You have dual zone climate in here, which is an unexpected surprise, and everything works, well, simply, elegantly. It's perfect, as is that. And that's important, isn't it? The manual box in this car is brilliant. A very short throw, very nice to use, and I'll talk a little bit more about it on the road. And what else do you need to know before I head out? Not all that much, really. The headlining is another disappointment. Feels like a very, very cheap piece of cardboard with some basic material on top of it. Good news though, you'd have to be about six foot three, I think, before you start to hit it. I'm 5'10", but with a long torso and I've still got adequate space. Other than that though, I'm probably being a little bit too harsh on the car because the overall feel of the interior is of a very, very nice sports focused car. Boot space is actually pretty good, and I would say more than adequate for anyone thinking of buying a car like this. One thing to note, it isn't particularly tall, but it's fairly wide and fairly deep too. Also worth mentioning, the car does have, as standard, a reversing camera, but one thing it does not have is parking sensors, and that could lead to a very, very embarrassing first day on the job. But you don't buy a car like this for boot space or reversing cameras, you buy it for the way that it drives. So how's that then? Better late than never, and Toyota GR86 take a bow. If I'd reviewed this about a month ago, it would have been in with a chance of being my favorite car of 2022. Yeah, it really is that good. All of these changes I just talked you through have transformed the 86 from a car that I was very mm, about to one where I'm thinking, how do I get my hands on one of these? Where do I even begin? Well, in the unlikeliest of places. And the one thing about this car that really shines, I simply expected nothing from. That engine, it's absolutely staggering. Toyota have turned easily the worst bit about the old 86 into its greatest asset. This thing is incredible. It pulls hard from just below 3000 RPM. And you'd then think, okay, what they've done is they've sacrificed that top end power to give you more mid-range torque. But wait, there's more, because you get to 4,500 RPM and then you get a second wind. The thing pulls even harder and it runs to that 7,500 RPM red line. This engine is not just considerably easier to drive thanks to that massive improvement in shove, but also a lot more enjoyable to rev out. And it feels every single one of its 230 horses. It's fabulous and all this car needs. The gearbox, likewise, absolutely brilliant, really direct, very short throw, very accurate, an absolute joy. 
It even sounds pretty decent, this thing. I'm convinced that's mostly from in here rather than out there. I haven't done my drive-by shots yet, and I know there is a bit of active sound enhancement going on. But I don't care. It sounds decent. Not award-winning, but decent. It's an enjoyable noise. The car also scores very highly in that all-important yet very intangible thing of how special it feels. You sit down in this and you do get that vibe of being in a proper old-school low-slung sports car. The fact it's a comparatively small car, it's both narrower and shorter than the equivalent Cayman, despite having the two admittedly useless back seats, means that it's not just easy to pilot through tight twisty streets like that and also to park, but roads where your modern day Ferrari, Lamborghini or even 911 now simply feel too big, this is absolutely perfect. It means that in many cases, places where in a Ferrari I'd be lifting off, slowing down, here I can maintain my speed because I know I'm just not taking up that much space. That's not to say it's a perfect car, it certainly has its fair share of flaws. For some reason, particularly after the first to second change, it's very easy to kangaroo hop this. The last car I had like it was my BMW Z4 M Coupe. In that car, it was down to a clutch delay valve, and I'm not sure whether Toyota have done the same thing here, but it certainly feels like it. It's also, at low speeds in particular, just too firm. Much like the Alpine A110 around town over potholes, this sort of thing we're about to encounter, it's just really, really stiff, more so than I think it needs to be. And road noise, while not obscene, is also certainly present. There's just a little bit more of it than I would like. For longer journeys, I do worry that could become irritating. But back in the land of good news, on that same journey, you can easily achieve about 34 to the gallon. Even around town and having a little bit of fun, I've been getting high 20s out of this. And you can have a lot of fun. That engine really is an absolute star. The chassis also feels considerably more competent than the old GT86. And once you do get the speed on, the car becomes a little bit more composed. It's never quite as delicate and supple as the Alpine, but it does a fairly good job nonetheless, particularly when you consider this is half the price. The brakes are good, not great. Likewise, visibility. Ahead, it's fairly decent, but your rear three quarters are somewhat restricted. Yes, you have little windows at the back, but you can't really see much out of them. The other thing to note, although it's certainly grippier than the old GT86, the tyres are still relatively modest. They are 215 4018s all round. So on occasion when coming out of a bend, I have put my foot down and the car's broken away a touch earlier than I've expected. It's also worth mentioning that even in its default mode, the traction control is quite liberal and will allow a bit more slip than you may expect. It isn't particularly well explained, but there are several modes for said traction control. By default, it is just on as you would expect it to be. However, press the off button here to the left for a long time, and it really is everything off. However, hold the button to the right, which is also marked track, and despite the fact you'll also get the traction off light, it's actually still somewhat on. What that does is activate a very clever mode. Below 31 mile an hour, it will let you have a lot of fun. Traction control is essentially disabled, though stability is still there in a slightly milder form. However, above 31 mile an hour, traction control is re-engaged. And that I like because, fact is, if you're playing around at 5, 10 mile an hour, you're not really going to get yourself into all that much trouble. However, at 50 mile an hour, things are a little bit different. And that mode means you should be able to have a bit of fun and avoid too many brown trouser moments. If I have one of these, I think my first order of the day would be to fit some slightly grippier rear tyres in particular because the car feels like it wants them. This is a beautiful thing to pilot. Dynamically, the only weak link that I can seem to see is the brakes. And I really mean that. They don't look meaty enough. I haven't had any real issues, but I happen to suspect if you were to take this car on track, they're probably the bit that's going to give up first. My major gripe with this car is the accelerator. I think in their quest to make sure this new version has a lot more torque than the old one, Toyota have pulled every trick in the book, including making the throttle pedal far too sensitive. It feels like all of the action of the pedal is bundled up into the first third of its travel. And that means around town, it can often be a fairly frustrating thing to drive. All right, let's check the turning circle, shall we? And it's really good, yeah. Very impressed. The beep, by the way, is your change-up warning. 
The car is geared nicely, 60 mile an hour in second, about 80 is the top of third, and those gears feel just about perfect. This is a car you can enjoy driving just gently off the mid-range, changing up at four, or you can take it all the way till it goes beep at you, and I think you'll get equal enjoyment either way. It's also a car that really does egg you on. You want to drive it hard, and yet when you do, you find yourself only carrying sort of 60 mile an hour. It's not as quick as you think, but that's great. That's what I want from a car like this. It's corners like this where I do have the occasional concern. When you've got a very quick transition, I do worry about overloading that rear. But it's magnificent, this thing. Really, really very special. <laughs> Toyota, why didn't you do this 10 years ago? Let's give us some beans, shall we? You may be able to hear there that when you do go to change up, the engine hangs the revs for quite a while. This seems to be a function of many modern cars. It's a frustration, but also one I can't really land at Toyota's feet. I'm sure if they could have done something about it, they would. I tell you what, it really doesn't help that the ride is vastly better at 60 than it is at 20. It means you want to carry more speed in this thing. What haven't I talked about? Well, the steering. It's electric, and I know that would give a lot of people cause for concern. Sure, it's not the best ever, but it's really very good. More communication than you might expect, though at lower speeds in particular, it does seem a touch inert. But the longer you drive this car, the more you realize it's actually still giving you all the information that you need. It's like hearing your favorite song, but being played by next door. The lyrics are there, they're just a bit muffled. And honestly, none of that has stopped me from singing along to what has to be one of Toyota's greatest hits. The 86 is a name attached to one of their most legendary cars. And I would entertain the argument that the original is perhaps a little bit too overrated and certainly now overvalued on account of one cartoon about a boy and his tofu delivery empire. But this really is that good. It's a sensational car and would suit equally anybody looking for their first sports car, but also somebody that maybe has a Ferrari or a Lamborghini tucked away and they want something fun but less valuable to drive day to day. And I do warn you, you drive this a fair bit and you'll start to wonder why you're bothering with the Ferrari or the Lamborghini. It really is that good. Would I have preferred it done slightly differently? Sure, I think there are a few things omitted that should have been standard. Parking sensors being an example. The stereo and associated door rattle are also unforgivable. I wish there was an option to fix that. But when you look at what it is that Toyota are giving you, a sporty coupe that sits on a bespoke platform with a bespoke engine, an interior that actually still feels pretty good, decent fuel economy, a big boot in a package that's not just usable but entertaining, this is a masterpiece. It would be a great value car at £40,000. So for Toyota to have sold it at £30,000, I think really deserves praise. My sole regret is that there aren't more of them. I have no doubt that a lot of the people who put their money down for one of these weren't doing so because they wanted the car, but instead they'd seen what had happened with the GR Yaris and the Scrabble to get one of those. They saw quick money and now are selling them for overs. There are three on Autotrader listed at about 35 to 36,000 pounds. And it should probably tell you everything you need to know about this car that I'd actually consider that a fair price, but my morals will not allow me to pay a penny over the list for a car such as this. And I've no doubt that there will be plenty of people for whom the useless back seats are a deal breaker. Likewise, there will still be plenty of people out there who need the combination of practicality and all season pace offered by something like a Golf R. But for the sporty driver who's happy to treat this as a two-seater, I'm pretty confident there is not going to be another car, possibly ever, that delivers you so much for so little. Is it perfect? No. But does it fix all the issues of the GT86 and then bring a little bit more to the party? Yes. And has it nailed the brief of being a small, back to basics, 2 plus 2 coupe that's real fun to drive? Absolutely. A huge thank you to Toyota for lending me this car. I'm going to now think of excuses as to why I need it for just a little bit longer. In the meantime, a big thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and 
I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.